Hello, and thank you for downloading Witness from the BBC World Service. And today we go back to New Year's Day 1994, when Mexicans awoke to the surprising news that a group of armed revolutionaries had seized control of several towns across the southern state of Chiapas. They demanded rights and recognition for the country's indigenous people, and they called themselves the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. Mike Lanchin reports. It's January 1st, 1994, and in Mexico, the new year has brought some dramatic news. Hundreds of armed peasants have seized control of four towns in southern Mexico in a protest over land rights. They're said to have withdrawn from one of them only to become involved in fighting with soldiers at a nearby military base. The thousand or more armed men who fought in this revolt are mainly Mayan Indians and impoverished peasants protesting at what they call capitalist oppression. The leadership of their self-proclaimed Zapatista Army of Liberation seemingly coming from organised Marxist revolutionaries. Father Gonzalo Iduarte is in the colonial town of San Cristobal de las Casas, high up in the mountains of Chiapas State. He's one of the first to realise that armed rebels have entered the town. Early in the morning, by dawn, the bell rang. And so I went to the window. I saw a group of about 20 Zapatistas. At that moment, we didn't know their name. All of them were with weapons taking position in, in the entrance of my home. Father Gonzalo rushes downstairs to open the door. The commander of the group is a young man from one of Mexico's large indigenous communities. He was wearing his traditional clothing, He was with his face covered, but when I saw his eyes, I recognized him because I had met him before as a member of a community, and he knew. He just said, look, Father, here I am representing the Zapatista army. We have taken San Cristobal. And the masked Indian rebel told the priest that they wanted the church to intervene in case the government started bombing the town. The rebels had taken their name from Mexico's legendary revolutionary, Emiliano Zapata. Several hundred of them had entered San Cristobal overnight, burning down police stations and opening up the local jail. At first light, Father Gonzalo ventured out onto the streets, but he found a surprisingly relaxed atmosphere. It was a large group of Zapatistas, Indians, men and women, all in their colourful clothing, In conversation with the people of of town, many people in San Cristobal went out to see and to dialogue with the Zapatistas. That was something I never expected to see because I thought all people in San Cristobal would flee. But that was not the sensation. Many people went out to ask them what they were looking for. I saw people from San Cristobal bringing coffee and bread. I, it was a big surprise for me. Do you remember any conversations that you had with any of the young Zapatista fighters? Uh, what I remember is talking with a very old Zapatista. It's just, uh, uh, how are you? What are you doing here? Uh, not much more than that. Of course, a little later I became aware of that many people were hiding at the, in their homes, afraid of what was, was happening. Father Gonzalo had been working for many years as a priest in Chiapas, one of Mexico's poorest states and home to one of its largest indigenous populations. He'd seen at first hand the dire conditions in which many indigenous people lived, in stark contrast to Mexico's skyscraper modern cities. The Indian communities were marginalised, there was a lack of work, they didn't have schools, they were under pressure of the landowners trying to get their lands. They had been for many years struggling for their rights. We don't have anything. Schools, teachers, let alone what they call technological development. We don't know what that is. It's strange that they talk to us about technology. We don't have a clue about that. We are more unknown than the most unknown. It was no coincidence that the rebels chose January 1st for their uprising. It was the day Mexico joined the North American Free Trade Agreement with the US and Canada. 
the Zapatista uprising had caught everyone by surprise. Not least a group of tourists visiting San Cristobal's beautiful colonial buildings and normally peaceful cobbled streets. There are tourists intermingling with the guerrillas. There are local people gathered in groups around the squares listening to what the guerrillas are saying about their motivation and their demands. We have had planes circling overhead, which I presume are Mexican military planes, and they've been coming fairly low. But as far as we can tell, they're not armed. With the army now closing in, tensions in the town were rising. Father Gonzalo persuaded the Zapatistas to allow the tourists safe passage. But when he got up early the next morning to escort them out, he found that the streets were now deserted. I got together with the tourists, but there was not even one Zapatista around. They withdrew during the night, before the army entered, and disappeared. The Mexican armed forces say they have almost regained complete control of the areas taken by the Zapatista National Liberation Army since the uprising began on Saturday. Mexican Air Force planes attacked a group of rebels on the outskirts of San Cristobal de las Casas, and isolated clashes have continued on the ground. The rebels have continued to withdraw from the towns they've taken to hide out in the remote mountain area they emerged from. One of the peasant fighters told me they had withdrawn to await new orders. He said they didn't fear the Mexican army and their struggle would continue. When the Federal Army entered San Cristobal, their attitude was aggressive, was one of control. People experienced that as a fearful experience, much more than uh, when the Zapatistas were present. Of course, I have to say that it's the people that would talk with me because they were people that were talking against me and all the diocese and the bishop. When the Zapatistas showed up, people began to say that Subcomandante Marcos was one of our priests and that uh, we had been given their weapons from the Church of Santo Domingo and the Cathedral in San Cristobal. Despite these accusations, the Catholic Church helped negotiate a ceasefire on January the 12th, and later a series of talks between the Zapatista leaders and the government, which were held in the large, imposing cathedral in the centre of San Cristóbal de las Casas. The government agreed to improve basic amenities in the indigenous communities and a loose form of self-rule. The rebellion's leaders were granted immunity from prosecution. It was a victory of sorts. But several hundred people died in the rebellion and an unknown number were left injured. So, 20 years on, what does Father Gonzalo think that the Zapatistas achieved? Things have changed in Mexico. The sense of dignity, the sense of autonomy of the Indian communities now is very strong. In Mexico there are more than 10 million Indians and I think all of them have benefited a little bit. So I think... The 10 days confrontation and the 20 years of struggle are worthwhile, although not enough. Father Gonzalo Iduarte still lives and works in Chiapas. The Zapatista movement is still campaigning peacefully for indigenous rights. También.